So how much should you charge for shipping? We're going to wrap up the series on shipping today. We talked about signing up for the big three in the first episode. We talked about software and packaging materials. And last week, we even talked about shipping large items like furniture. So today, we're going to dive into shipping strategies. How much should you charge to ship your products? Hi, my name's Roger. This is Working at Woodworking Podcast, where I hope to provide you information and encouragement to take your woodworking hobby to the next level. Becoming a professional, serving your local community, or maybe you are a woodworking professional, and there's just some things that really, really confuse you. Hopefully, I can help. How much you should charge for shipping is actually question number two, right after how much should I charge for my wood products. We covered that pretty extensively in uh, episode number 28 and 29, How to Price Your Woodwork. And going right along with that is shipping cost. And really, shipping cost depends on a number of factors. Who is your customer? Are you catering more to kind of a bargain shopper customer where there's some price sensitivity? Or are you selling higher end products where the uniqueness and the quality and the beauty of the product is more important? For the bargain shoppers, price is everything. And if they think your shipping charges are too high, they're going to run. On the other hand, people who are looking for that higher priced, very unique item, shipping charge isn't going to play that big of a factor into it. And of course, the size of the products that you're selling, you know, small, medium, large items, all of those are going to uh, factor into this. Are you selling more commodity type things, you know, small, medium sized rolling pins or maybe large charcuterie boards? That's going to factor into your shipping cost. Luxury goods, the jewelry box, humidors with a bunch of marketry, it can all have a different shipping price strategy. So method number one, free shipping. Yay, free shipping. Well, there is no free lunch. And if you're over like the age of five, you've probably figured that out by now. Someone is paying for shipping. Now, it could be you where you just say, I don't care. I'll pay for shipping out of my pocket. Open up my billfold. Here's the $25 that it will take to ship your product to California. I don't have a problem with that. Well, you will until you start seeing your profits, you know, sink, you know, into the abyss. So how actually do you come up with the price for free shipping? Well, you have to take your selling price and add to it your average shipping cost. And that is your new selling price with free shipping. And the trick here is figuring out your average shipping cost. If you're confined into like a regional area, that might be really easy. You're using USPS regional boxes. It is almost always between $12 and $14. Boom. That is super simple. But if you're shipping a whole bunch of stuff all the way across the country and the number of large cities in between that, your shipping costs can be all over the place. Now we have to get into finding a weighted average. How many customers do you have in California? How many in Texas? How many in your own state? And depending on your product, you might see patterns start to develop. I have one product that sells incredibly well in California. I have other products that I don't think I've ever shipped to California. And so we have to take that individual product and look at these shipping patterns and come up with some, well, guess as to what the average shipping cost is for that product. Now, there's a number of positives with free shipping. One number. The customer sees one number. And hopefully, the way you have built your online presence, they also immediately know that that price includes free shipping. If it's buried down into the fine print, people don't read. 
It needs to be front and center so they can see it. And then their mind kind of shifts a gear and says, okay, that's with free shipping, so I don't have to worry about that, as they go through their buying process. And this gets into what's called buyer UX, user experience. And it goes something like this. The customer is looking at your item and they make a decision. Yes, I want to buy. And they add it to the cart. Then they either continue shopping or they go immediately to the checkout. They enter their personal info. They enter their payment information. And then they hit the submit button and they buy the item. Super simple. Not a problem. But there are some not so good things about free shipping. Number one, you kind of have to stay on top of it. It's not something where you set the price in 2017 and just forget about it. Because, well, (laughs) if you haven't raised your price since 2017, there's other issues. But you have to constantly monitor shipping costs. Monthly, quarterly, hopefully at least annually. Or any time that one of the big three carriers has a new price change. And again, you have to make sure your customers know that it's free shipping. Many customers just don't notice it. And that's money that you're just leaving on the table. And in a way, free shipping kind of punishes your local customers. I've had some people, you know, email me or or phone me. Can I just pick that up at your place, at your shop? Because they know that there's a shipping cost built into that and they're hoping to save, you know, 20 bucks if they just pick it up. Generally, I accommodate them. And the other kind of con to free shipping, your price just went up. Where somebody else is selling something for $100, you're selling it for 125 with free shipping. But the other person may be charging shipping. But yeah, I have free shipping. But a lot of customers aren't going to put those two and two together. And sometimes people in that are very distant from you kind of get a price break. So if your average shipping cost is $25, and that's what you've added onto your, your product, but it actually costs $45 to get the most distant customer, well, you just were under by $20. And if you get a whole bunch of customers... You know, they they share, you know, look at this jewelry box I I just bought. And you get a whole bunch of more customers from that area. Good for you. But you're starting to tick down on that break-even idea of average shipping. So that can kind of become a problem. If you go ahead and raise your price to $45, then the person in your state, in your city, if they figure that out, well, I'm not paying an extra $45 whenever I could drive over and pick it up. It, it it can cause customer confusion. So I'm not saying that free shipping is bad. It just comes with its own set of problems. Now, if you're a company like L.L. Bean, I've never known L.L. Bean to charge shipping. My entire life, my adult purchasing life, they've always offered free shipping. Now, obviously, they're just not giving that away. They're building that into the cost of the product, but they have established that. And I would imagine that when you're shipping, you know, 20 trillion items a day, um, you get pretty good rates from your, from your carriers. Now, the other advantage of free shipping for you, it's simple. It's really simple. Come up with a number that you're going to add to your product, 20 bucks, 25 bucks, whatever, and it's done. It's over with. You don't have to worry about any of the other strategies that we're going to talk about because you just simplified your life. Now, any Etsy sellers out there know of the push Etsy almost mandated a few years ago that thou shall offer free shipping on any item under $35. A lot of people interpreted that as if you're not offering free shipping, Etsy is really going to push your search results way down to the bottom. And they're only going to display people with free shipping at the very top. I jumped into the free shipping thing and I raised my prices because obviously I can't give shipping away. And I figured, okay, either I'm going to go out of business selling this product or people are still going to buy it. Surprise, surprise, people still bought. 
which probably indicates more to the fact that I was underpriced on that. I need to go back and listen to, what, episode 28, because I I really think that I was uh, undervalued on that uh, retail price. And I had some customers convo me, how much is shipping going to be for this? Well, again, people don't read. And with the Etsy platform, it wasn't terribly clear initially that this is free shipping. If you were on the Etsy forums, there were people all over the place over the free shipping mandate. Well, not really a mandate, a strongly worded suggestion. And there were several people who, well, there were some people who left Etsy. There were other people who decided to give it a try. And there were several people who posted that I tried free shipping and my sales went down. I removed free shipping and my sales have skyrocketed. And that encouraged me to remove free shipping on one item because, again, I was shipping a lot to the West Coast and my average shipping cost was under what it took to get to the West Coast. And I just didn't feel right inflating my retail price to cover just the West Coast sales. So I ended up dropping free shipping. And I've, again, feared my sales are going to crash and I'm going to go out of business. And surprise, surprise, it didn't happen. So advice on free shipping? Tread lightly. Know where all the booby traps are. There's advantages and disadvantages. Method number two, the true and actual cost of shipping. If it costs $17.93 to ship your item to Topeka, that's what you charge the customer. Cost what it costs. Now, in a perfect world, especially if you're a computer programmer, that works out wonderfully. But in the real world, mere mortals, that can be a little tough to come up with. Again, it kind of depends on your product. If you're shipping mainly with Big 3, you can probably get it narrowed down. If most of your orders are coming online, it's going to be a little more challenging. Now, if you're working with a platform like Etsy, they offer that service where they will calculate the actual selling cost. They are using USPS. And as we covered in the previous episodes, we know that USPS is really good at shipping light, small packages regionally. But if we're starting to ship a large, heavy object across the country, it gets really, really expensive. And I've tracked this. I've watched it with USPS and FedEx and UPS. If you are shipping any distance, a heavy or large object, which gets that cubic pricing, then USPS is not going to be your cheapest object. But if your system is set up to calculate shipping only with USPS, you're going to get inflated numbers. Now, the one thing that surprised me with Etsy is people don't seem to care. That's the price they say. That's what I'm paying. Yay for them. Thank you. I greatly appreciate your business. There are some platforms that have really good programmers behind them, and they can actually do a best price shipping comparison where they'll take USPS, FedEx, and UPS, and they compare the prices. They'll even display those prices with the estimated time of delivery and let the customer choose the one that they want. That is a way above my pay grade. And these are typically very, very, very large companies that can pull this off. That's getting into the use of APIs, the little computer applications that interface with other computers, and that's, that's, that can get very, very complicated. Brick and mortar stores, you can just ask the person to wait a moment and jump on, you know, USPS or FedEx and enter their address and boom, it comes back. It's going to be $23.92 and you can establish that right there. But if you're having a whole bunch of customers, that's going to get very tedious very quickly. So probably the biggest pro of using actual cost is it's it's fair. It's even. Everyone's paying exactly what it, it, the true cost is to receive that product. It also creates a lower price because instead of 
pricing your item at $125, you can price it at $100 plus shipping. And so if somebody in the next state is buying that, it's going to be one number. If someone all the way across the country is going to buy it, it's going to be a larger number. And people in Hawaii, I think they are resigned that shipping is going to be very expensive. And I've shipped a number of items to Hawaii, and they always seem to be very appreciative. Method number three, subsidized shipping. This is where you take number one and number two, add those together, divide by two, and you come up with a subsidized shipping cost number. I am going to charge the customer $20 for shipping on this item. Is that number accurate? Well, that's where you're going to have to put your math skills together by keeping track of the shipping cost for that item over a month, a quarter, a year, and dividing out by the number of shipments, and you'll see if you are close or not. And you kind of get a feel for this whenever you're you're buying shipping. It's not saying that shipping is free, where you have to build that number into the retail cost, and you're not going through all the gymnastics of using an API to calculate the true shipping cost for one particular carrier, but you're just going to kind of ask customers to share in the shipping cost. Some are going to overpay, some are going to underpay, but hopefully on average, it all equals out. And again, we get back to that buying funnel, the buyer UX. The buyer makes a decision to buy your product, they click add to cart, they click checkout, They enter their personal information, they enter the payment info, and then they see the shipping added. Now they have to reevaluate the entire process. Do I really want to buy this if they're charging that much for shipping? They may hit the submit button, they may not. You don't want surprises in that buyer's funnel. So that's why if you have a $20 flat shipping charge right there, very prominent, right next to the retail price, they don't get surprised. People don't like surprises. You don't want to bury the shipping charge down in the buyer's funnel. And if we go back and visit our friends at Vermont Wood Studio that we talked about last week, they are using a tiered subsidized shipping model, where if you purchase something from them, up to $999, they're going to charge $199 shipping. In other words, under $1,000, it's $200. Between $1,000 and $2,000, it's $249, $250. And if you are purchasing over $4,000, hey, we will cover the cost on shipping, free shipping. So there's a three-level tiered system where they are just assuming that if you're spending $750 on something, you're also going to spend $200 to receive it. Now, that type of system kind of dissuades low-cost items. So if a person is looking at an item that costs $140, well, they're not going to be wowed about spending more than that to receive it. That's where for that particular item, you might want to set up some special pricing structure just for that particular item. But this form of subsidized pricing can work very well. When I was selling stuff on Amazon, I was able to use that. And the way they set up their API, it was actually fairly easy to set up the the different pricing structures. I wouldn't call it pleasant, but it wasn't incredibly difficult. Now, conversely, you can also use this type of pricing structure to kind of encourage more spending. So that if a person was looking at that $750 item, knowing they're going to have to pay $200 for shipping, ooh, look at this end table. That's $500. That would put us over that $1,000 threshold, and the shipping would only be an extra $50. So you could actually kind of upsell with that type of strategy and basically bring in a little higher 
uh, ticket item sales. Now, disadvantages of this type of strategy, it might be hard to evaluate. You're going to really have to, to stay on top of the numbers to make sure that you're not losing your shirt on this. But that's the same thing you face with the, the free shipping strategy. Now, the fourth and final method is a revenue stream strategy. Yeah, you're looking at this as a profit center. You're going to make money on shipping. If it costs us $25 to ship this to our customer in the most distant part of the country, we're going to add an extra $10 to it just for the fun of it. Or we're going to add a 10% upcharge just because we want to make a little more money. It kind of sounds maybe a little brazen to some people, but one of the big advantages of doing it this way is you're actually covering your true cost. Because up until this point, when we were looking at the cost of shipping an item, we were just looking at the cost from USPS, FedEx, or UPS. Did we actually factor in the packaging, the box, the padding, the void fill? The tape? The labeling? No, we didn't mention that at all. So we're literally giving that stuff away. Oh, and we didn't factor in how much time it's going to take you to put all of this together just to get your package ready to take to one of the big three carriers. That's money down the drain. Poof, that's gone. And if you want to stay in business, you can't be giving stuff away. There's one supplier that I, I buy products from, materials, and it's $47.13 plus 3% shipping and handling. And you know, I don't have a problem with that because he is literally trying to cover, you know, and it's a big heavy box, a double wall box that, that he's using. And he's trying to recover some of that money in a an accounting line item type way. Now, of course, he could have just put the $47 plus 3% and added that together and put that down for shipping. But in a way, he's actually being a little bit more honest. This is what UPS is charging me to ship. I'm adding on this 3% just to try to cover my material cost. And I bet a lot of you haven't been doing that. Now, can you do this on a relatively low-cost commodity type item? Eh, maybe. Could you do this on a, a high-end luxury type item? If you're selling a $4,000 marquetry jewelry box. Yeah, by all means. Because again, people aren't going to be price sensitive on the shipping cost on something like that. So there's four methods that you could use as kind of a framework to figure out your shipping strategy. Now, some other things you need to consider while you're doing that. Customers may not realize how expensive it is to ship things. And if you've been buying things online or maybe through catalogs, you know that buying a pair of jeans from Minnesota, that shipping is actually a little steep now. And it really kind of begs the question, how price sensitive are you to shipping? You know, do you totally freak out when they tell you it's going to cost $12.50 to get a pack of 100 number six bronze screws to you from Rhode Island? Well, <laughs> take a chill pill, but you know, we have to cover these expenses. The way you think about shipping is definitely going to impact the way you are going to charge shipping on your products. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And again, you just really have to look at who is your average customer. And of course, the thing with averages is they're always changing. They're always evolving. And the competition, what's your competition? Now, you might not really have competition. Yeah, no, you have competition. What is your competition doing? And of course, the other big thing that you may not think about is time versus money. You're a one-person shop. You may not have time to launch a three-week analysis into shipping cost of an XYZ that costs $20. So you kind of have to almost go with a number and just see how it works. One of the huge advantages of a one-person shop is you can change stuff. 
You don't have to meet with the board of directors. You don't have to go through 17 layers of management. Just change it. And don't get stuck in paralysis by analysis. This is shipping that we're talking about. It's not rocket science. I would like to give a, a little update about U-Ship that I mentioned the last episode. I got an email from a, a customer in a nearby city, and he included a number of photos. It was a, a canoe that was missing its bow. Yeah, the bow was gone. It was no longer there. It was, well, literally ripped off the boat. And he inquired as to if I could fix this. And it's like, before we go any further, you have got to tell me the story. He didn't go into the gory details. He just replied with, uh, damaged by you ship. Uh Oh, (laughs) yeah. After I was touting their virtues, uh, last, uh, last episode, but you know, things happen. And again, the best protection you have for your product is how you ship it. So kind of have to keep that in consideration. So recommendations for more information on these different types of shipping strategy, actually check out Etsy. They've written a very good guide. I took a lot of this information from. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And I hope you have found this series helpful. Shipping costs can be a very, very confusing subject. And honestly, I've just kind of muddled through it over the years. I learned quite a bit in doing the research for this and have actually come up with some new ideas that I'm going to to implement. And if you have any questions about shipping, something we haven't discussed here, feel free to, to reach out. Shoot me an email. Give me a phone call. Love to talk to you about it. A special shout out to our listeners in Brisbane, Australia, and also in Seattle, Washington. And as always, I'd love it if you would support the show. Buy me a cup of coffee. Link in the show notes. And until next week, happy woodworking.